gets better to make progress and to be right. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm thrilled to have my next guest today. We have Michael Mogul, who is the founder and CEO of Crisp. And maybe you aren't familiar with Crisp, but you probably have heard of his podcast called The Game Changing Attorney. Uh, he also was a best selling author of a book by the same name um, and a little bit more about crisp but basically they um they help other law firms do um basically grow. I mean, there's no other way to, to look at it. And we'll talk a little bit more about Michael, how he came up with the idea, how he uh, decided that this was a white space in the market and really how he's grown uh, grown to be, really be the, the guy that helps law firms um, really get their messaging out there and stand apart from the competition to grow into not only um, not only uh, extraordinarily fast, but also attract high value clients. Uh, Michael, also, uh, we were introduced to each other by uh, John Rulin, who uh, is amazing. He was uh, just speaking at one of your conferences as well, Michael, and uh, and just told me how much fun it was and how much energy there was in the room. Uh, Gary was also, I guess, speaking there too. So we'll have to hear a little bit more about that and sort of what what occurred at that conference. But anyway, thank you so much for being on, Michael. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in Atlanta uh, and uh, you and I chatted a little bit. You were saying that you uh, got to try Hint and, and you've got kids that are trying the Hint boxes as well. I love it. So, so, so great. So um, talk to me a little bit about you as a as a kid growing up, did you always know that you would be doing what you're doing today and and uh, that you could influence and and really help so many people build their businesses? So the short answer is no. I, I will say I, and I've, I've joked about this before that I was born uh, like 10 years too late because growing up as a kid, I loved anything technology, anything tech. And I was just I was the type of kid where. I even learned like HTML, but I, we didn't have a computer. So I would like, I'd buy an HTML book and I try to just learn it without a computer. Isn't that amazing? Like I, we, we'd go to the library, we'd get these books and then I just would learn it, just kind of trying to work with it and in, uh, in the scripting. But, you know, when I was a kid early on, I think one of the first businesses I had was a web design uh, business. So I was 13 years old and like we've had clients like anything from like a tutoring company to uh, a martial arts business or whatever it is they you know they'd come in like my mom would let them in the front door i'd be sitting there developing their websites but i was i mean again i you know 13 so this is right when the dot com boom was taking off and that's why i'm saying i you know i wish i was born maybe like 10 years earlier because as all this stuff was happening i was just so young um and i didn't realize at the time how you know i guess how unique that was if if, if that's a way to put it as far as like having a you know, a business at that age. But, you know, growing up, I, I think it was just, it, I was always gravitating towards something entrepreneurial. And where it caused me a lot of trouble was because it kind of was outside the norms, like growing up as a kid and, you know, going through school, elementary school, middle school, and so on. Um, my way of thinking, I used to think there was something wrong with me, like just in the sense that, um, you know, I, I always looked at what we were doing in classes and so on. And I just I was very interested in thinking perhaps outside the box, which led to my parents being called in a lot because, you know, I grew up immigrant parents, my family and I, we so we immigrated from Eastern Europe and came over to the U.S. in 1990. So I came over. It was my brother and I, my parents and my grandparents. And I was four years old. So um, when we got to America, um, basically, there's really two paths that you can pursue as the child of immigrants, which is doctor or lawyer. Uh, so, but entrepreneur was very much something that I think is, is not understood. And it took, you know, I think it took a while for my parents to come around to that, but you know, it, you know, to bring it all full circle. Yes. I think I was entrepreneurial, but I did not know like 
that I was that like entrepreneurship, as, as you know, back then it wasn't Shark Tank, like it wasn't very much popularized. And when I was starting a business, I didn't really, I mean, to me, it wasn't about business cards or titles. Um, it was really about, you know, serving somebody and then acquiring that first customer and then acquiring another one. But I didn't know what I was doing was, you know, I didn't call myself an entrepreneur or CEO of anything. It was just, you know, scaling, you know, zero to one and then one to two and beyond. That's absolutely true. So talk to us a little bit about Crisp or, or kind of what happened before Crisp? How did this idea come about? Yeah. So this is, uh, I'll give you the shortest version of it. So as I mentioned, you know, the two career paths that you can take with immigrant parents is, is doctor or lawyer. So I was, I was going to school. I was in college. I was pre-med. I took the MCAT, was going to go to med school. Um, I got into three medical schools, but I spent a lot of time shadowing doctors, uh, over a hundred hours, like shadowing doctors and surgeons and just it, for me, like being entrepreneurial and, and hearing the conversations and, and interestingly enough, this will all come full circle later, but just seeing the, the things that they would deal with constantly, that so much being outside of their hands, all the um, just all the bureaucracy, the consolidation of it all. It just didn't sit well with me. Um, so I figured, OK, I'm going to put in for a deferral. I'm not going to go to medical school. I didn't have some alternate plan. And then, so this was in you know, 2008. I was you know, I graduated with honors um, from undergrad, got into med school, decided not to go right as the economy comes crashing down. And my parents probably thought that like their entire investment in me and coming over here and starting over um, just in their careers and not having any money, their son going all the way through school, getting into medical school and deciding not to go. I was probably the greatest disappointment <laughs> you can imagine for a child of immigrants. Uh, and, and here I am, I'm, I'm washing dishes at a dive bar. That was the only place I could get a job. Uh, this is back in 2008. And from there, I went from washing dishes to really washing lab equipment at the CDC, like the Centers for Disease Control. And I, I had a unique situation where um, I, I had a mentor that there who was working on like cdc.gov, their website. And she like worked on kind of the user experience side. So when she went on maternity leave, I was the person who was doing what was called like Section 508 compliance, which is, you know, compliance for um, websites to, you know, to help those with like uh, you know, the blind screen readers, that type of stuff. And that allowed me to do a lot of web development work. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to go to med school. Uh, I wasn't sure if I'd go back to school and either, you know, uh, go to graduate school, get an MBA or something else. So I just figured, OK, well, let me just start learning, you know, picking up some skills. And I'd read different books on like on coding. I'd learn PhD and JavaScript. And I, then I started learning about finance and just, I would do something productive because, you know, it really came down to, I didn't want to sit in traffic and the commute to get to, to get to the CDC was, you know, about an hour. So I figured if I could just get there an hour earlier, I'd skip traffic and then I could, you know, I could study. And then if I stayed late, I'd skip traffic that way too. So I just wouldn't, you know, spend a lot of time in the car. So that's where I did a lot of that learning. And during that time I bought a camera uh, because I figured this would be an, a nice lifetime hobby to learn how to take pictures of just, you know, plants and nature and that type of stuff. And for me, my hobbies always turn into more than hobbies. So I would get obsessed and like photography, you know, just just like a hobbyist activity turned into me taking photos at like different bars and restaurants. And then that turned into a business. So I, you know, I'd finish at the CDC, you know, at like six o'clock. And then, you know, this business would start at like eight o'clock and go till two in the morning. And then I'd get home, I'd process the photos. And then, um, you know, and then I go you know, back to work at the CDC. And that eventually, you know, turned into a full-time business. So it was originally a photography company. And then we expanded to do video as well, which would really turn into a, a company where we were doing all photo and video for probably 90% of the bars and restaurants and hospitality venues in Atlanta. And then after years of that, I, I basically realized one, half of our clients would go out of business every year, like bars and restaurants would turn over. Um, two, if it rained outside or something like that on a Friday, that would significantly impact the turnout to a venue. And then the majority of the industry, um, many of them wouldn't even wake up till noon or one o'clock. And I just figured like with what I was trying to build, we had 90% market share, but that wasn't saying a whole lot, you know? So I figured, I, you know, I figured I was sitting at the wrong table. So if I had to build a new business, how could I build it around our ideal clients, which were really our corporate clients, like originally like Coca-Cola or the W hotels. So that was really where the crisp started and crisp started as a video company. So we were doing corporate video for larger brands. And this is primarily digital and for the web, which in 2012, when I started, everyone told me there was no, future in online video, that we would not be able to compete with the agencies, that everything was still TV based. And, and again, the social platforms weren't 
aren't, you know, they weren't what they are today. And YouTube you know, wasn't as popularized as it is today. But that's where we leaned in. And from there, video, like it was video for everyone, um, all industries. We did not have a focus. And then, you know, as, as we grew, you know, we actually started to focus in on the legal industry, which also happened by accident. And then that, you know, that expanded from video to marketing to then leadership coaching. And, you know, there's a longer story around all this, but I stumbled into legal completely by accident. But essentially, that was kind of the, the progress that was made. And the more we focused in, I, I think the more the business grew. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer. And yet now we work exclusively with law lawyers and law firms. And, and I can share why. But it really, at the, at the root of it all, the expansion of the business really stemmed from like, wanting to better serve our clients. And I realized with video alone, we would help them differentiate and stand out. But then many of them just didn't know how to get that content out there to their ideal clients, which is where we introduced the marketing. And then once we got their phone ringing, we actually realized that the, the, the next problem that was created was that many of them didn't know how to answer the phones consistently. There wasn't an intake team in place. There wasn't a leadership team. Uh, the culture wasn't right. All those things that, you know, you get, of course, you can get calls coming in. But if you can't actually deliver on that and scale that business, um, then it would be you know, very difficult to see a return on any marketing. So that's where we introduced the leadership coaching side. And, and that's when, when you said we're really we just help law firms grow. I'm glad you said it that way, because um, when, people, you know, when we say we're a law firm growth company, people will say, well, what is that? And we say, OK, well, I think it really starts at the foundation of getting the leadership team right, um, the culture of the organization, the business development, just the foundation, everything operationally. And then you can layer on the marketing and the content. But most I, I think most organizations like to start the other way. They, they like the exciting marketing stuff. And you find that that only gets you to a certain point if the infrastructure isn't in place to really scale. So interesting. Well, I think, too, first of all, law firms don't go out of business very often. So uh, different than than the bar and restaurant scene. So it was a good pick from that standpoint. But also I have many attorneys around me, friends, family. I'm married to a recovering attorney uh, as well. And I, I uh, can say that I feel like you know, they're so focused on servicing their clients, um, but they're not actually, and it's all word of mouth and on, on the cases that you're doing, or maybe it doesn't go to court, but you know, you're working on the, the before. Uh, so I think there are great stories that are definitely there to be told. And you've focusing on one industry and getting that formula right. Um, and being able to take that into, um, into other, uh, businesses so that they can learn from people in their industry is just so huge. So I love, I love, love, love what you're doing. So I read that you, it took you 21 failed pitches um, before you reached your, your first yes. So I certainly have my own story around, uh, around pitching, pitching, and nobody would take it. But how do you get back up? How do you like just decide, I, I, maybe I'm doing the wrong pitch, the wrong industry. Uh, you know, I think I need to go back to bed at this point. Yeah. So 22 has become somewhat of a lucky number for me in, in the sense that it really took, you know, it was, it was the 22nd pitch that, that, you know, we received, you know, we got our first client, the first yes. And then Chris really started, uh, Chris was born. But when, and when it came to it, when people asked, well, why did it, you know, why did you keep going? Like, why not stop? I think a reasonable human being may stop after, you know, I don't know, five failed attempts or 13 failed attempts or 16. And I remember, I think it was around 16. Uh, I called my father and because I was trying to start this business and, and I was telling them about this consistent failure. And these weren't, when I say failed pitches, these weren't like an email and somebody told me, no, I mean, this, these were full in-person meetings meetings, presenting things and just it, 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 full preparation and then being told no. Uh, but I remember after 13 or 16 no's or so, I called my dad. I was telling him about this um, and expecting encouragement. And he actually said, I think you should hang it up and go back to, you know, go to medical school. Um, but and I understand that now being being a, a parent of my own. But I, I think what kept me going was I just it was almost like there wasn't a plan B. And, and when, I, when I say that in the sense that a lot of people will say, well, if it didn't work out, like you still had your parents and you could have moved back home and you could have done all this. And I don't know if the person saying that understands um, truly what it is like to have your parents sacrifice everything in their life. Well, they have two great careers in another country. Come over to America, not speak the language. We have no family here. We have no money here and do it all to create opportunity for their children. And then to do that and they become adults and then to basically have those adult children um, ask to move back in with them. I would sooner 
um, and I and I mean this 100% honestly and, and truthfully. I would have sooner uh, been homeless and slept in the street than asked like my parents to move back in. So I kept going because like for one, it's just that failure wasn't an option. And who knows? I don't know if I would have taken it to like a hundred failures or something. I mean, at some point, it, you know, I think you run completely out of money. But uh, what really did keep me going was I saw that there was a future in in digital video. Like I, you know, over time, I you know, this. I guess my confidence has grown in being able to get a sense of where industry trends are going. And I was starting to see that although a lot of the people that I was speaking to uh, didn't really see that same future that I did, uh, I did see that there was something there and there was obviously something brewing. And then also just in the in a lot of the small businesses that I would, I would approach, they all had very similar challenges. They, had, they were in very saturated competitive markets. They were struggling to stand out and differentiate. Um, they couldn't compete. They didn't have the same amount of resources as the large players in their markets. So they couldn't do things like TV and radio and billboards. And yet they cared deeply about the, you know serving their clients. So how were they to stand out and differentiate? And I saw this lower barrier to entry, particularly on social media, and for them to be able to convey their story and be able to articulate, here's why we do what we do, not just here's the services we offer, but to be able to tell that to someone, that could really help to give them a competitive advantage where there weren't many for them. So that's what kept me pressing forward. I think it's just this true belief is that there's something there. And then I also have this, I mean, this has been a lifetime, perhaps fear of mine. I have seen a lot of people that will, they will take a hard punch and not get back up. And I worry about that. So like, I, I think that it, it's, uh, it's only really failure when you quit. And it's, it, if you keep going, it's like that next iteration, that next iteration, I worry for myself what would happen if I actually would have given up. So that's what, that's what kept me going too. Cause if I would have given up, well, then this whole entrepreneurial dream ends and maybe I do go back to school and then maybe I do end up doing something that may, may not be in alignment with either my purpose or what I really enjoy doing. And if, you know, and if I couldn't make that work, would I just spend the rest of my life resenting, you know, not giving it a full shot? That's so great. I think in many ways, what you described, too, is actually having parents who, you know, had their own challenges, right? And you seeing that, even though your parents want a better life for you, uh, clearly, and don't want to see you fail, I think you seeing that they were able to push through and and do something pretty large. Uh, I always think that when we go through challenges, uh, when you know, whether it's immigrating to a new country or go through challenging times. I mean, kids are sponges, right? They pick up on that. Um, I don't think it's such a bad thing either because it teaches you resilience. It teaches you perseverance and the ability to, you know, keep pushing forward. I worry more for, you know, my kids when things aren't going wrong, right? That when things are going to be challenging for them, are they going to be equipped like I was to be able to see you know, challenging times. So I love that story for sure. Uh, so on the other side of the coin, I heard you once state that it's better to make progress uh, than to be right. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. So this is really kind of a testament to my evolution. Well, I believe as, as a human being, and, and there's been a great deal of evolution from the very beginning. Um, and, and this is a thing I do not understand. And, and Kara, I'd even love your thoughts on this. I do not understand how anyone can achieve any level of success, and especially the, the people who bootstrap and really start from you know some ground zero. And then after having achieved that success, can have any degree of just ego. I don't get it. And, and I say this because it is, it is such a humbling process that you must go through with just, you know, in, in, in building a business and there's so much adversity and there's so much failure that any ego you come in with, I think, you know, I like to believe you have that beaten out of you. So when, when you mentioned, um, you saying like, it's better to make progress than to be right. Um, it really does stem from the fact of what's really the most important thing. And I used to be of the belief that it had to be me solving every problem and I had to be the, the guy or, or, or whatever it is. Um, and that really, I think that led to a lot of one, it slowed me down. Um, two, it created a lot of needless suffering and me kind of banging my head against the wall, thinking that I had to be the expert of things that were not my strengths. Um, today, it's, it's the complete opposite. I'm asking questions. I've got amazing people around me. I'm listening to them. And it's it's less about my way and more about what's you know, what's going to help to move us forward. And to be honest, I actually really don't even care that, you know, if, I'm, if I'm right or wrong. I just care that we're uh, that we're growing and you know we're, we're better serving our clients and that the team is more successful. So um, I, 
think a lot of that is, you know, a lot of people that have the, this ego, I think it creates blind spots. Um, and when, when you are so guarded saying, well, I have to be right, um, it, you don't have the right type of, I think, type of conversations in an organization. There's not candor that's taking place or there's always like the meetings after meetings where you, you'll have a meeting discussing an item, for example, um, and then people go on walks. And that's really the, where the real conversations are taking place. So uh, I've tried to set this example and I, and I do it through almost like a series of consistent cautionary tales where I'm sharing all my, you know, my failures and mistakes and bad decisions with, with our, you know, with our team and with our leaders to, to hopefully just encourage them to, to believe that um, being open and being vulnerable is really great for, for a team and, and, and great for a culture. And if we can prioritize almost like a bias towards action and, and, and just making progress of what's in the best interest, I always look at like three, three things of like what's in the best interest of our team, our clients, and then of crisp. And, and if it checks the box on all three, then that's, that's the right thing to do. And if it doesn't check the box on one of those, then, you know, that it's probably not the right thing to do, but it's less about me and, and me being right and more about, okay, what is the path forward? Totally agree. So one of the things, uh, that, or I should say, you've got a book and you've also got a podcast. I was on your podcast the other day, the game changing attorney, and I, I love that you focus on storytelling and, you know, content creation. I think so many times people, um, especially people who are maybe in more professional kind of uh, roles like attorneys or doctors, uh, but also CEOs, like they don't really pay attention to, they think social media is about pretty pictures and I don't know, like likes and followers. I don't know what people, some people think, but they don't really... think of it as a place to kind of share what you are good at, what you represent, what you, you know, some of your successes and how it's relevant. And I think through stories, that's how we actually help people, um, you know, build some sort of connection to why it's important to listen or read or, or whatever it is. So can you share a little bit more about that and what you've seen around content creation. Yeah, and I think you know, oftentimes when, when I would talk about the importance of storytelling and the emotional connection that results, I, sometimes uh, people who have not seen this in play, they kind of roll their eyes, they think this is a cute thing to talk about articulating your why, but it really is a great business decision too. And, and the reason being is that they, especially in spaces where people offer similar services or similar products, um, those stories are not just about the services you offer, but the reason why you do what you do. That's how these connections are formed. And those that form connections, I mean, those those actually become the ones that become the followers, your audience, and then you know perhaps eventually your, your buyers and then your advocates and, and so on. And I realized that if you do not give somebody a reason to care about you or your brand, um, then they'll gravitate towards the brands that do. So it's very, very important to, you know, for example, we work with you know with lawyers and law firms, and people always ask me. They're like, "Oh, that's you know." Most do not have a, gr- a very great perception of lawyers and law firms, and I think this is because of the exact opposite effect that most legal advertising is not story driven. It's kind of like you know, in a wreck, get a check, or call me now, or somebody standing on top of a semi truck. Um, it the, the, a lot of the TV advertising I think has created almost this level of distrust towards lawyers. It's very different from like you know the a way people would approach a doctor, right? Like if a doctor. Were to, were to tell you something, they'd say, okay, that's, there's a level of warmth and trust there. They may not feel that way about lawyers. So they say, well, why, why do you, you know, why do you help lawyers and law firms? And I, I think if people really consider, well, who are the people that they help? Because when you look at like most lawyers and law firms, they're helping people that may not have access to justice. They're helping people that um, have, are re- usually reaching out to them on perhaps one of the worst days of their lives. Um, someone has been injured, either it's them or someone in their family, and they're not able to cover the medical bills or, or for whatever reason, or if it's a dangerous or defective drug. Like you do need some lawyers for society. I think it helps to maintain a level of checks and balances on corporations and then also to help those in need. So, uh, so for that reason, you know, when, when we do work with our clients, each of them has a reason why they became an attorney. Like that's really where we start. Like why this? And you know, you, you were smart. You could have done something else. You could have become an accountant. You could have been done you know, something else. Like why did you become a lawyer? And it's interesting because everyone has a very different reason. 
And it may have been because they grew up and they didn't like bullies or they saw some level of injustice that they or their family experienced. And they knew that when they grew up, they wanted to drive that change or something in their community. And they wanted to be able to come back and um, and better serve that community, for, you know, for whatever reason. But then when you start to communicate and convey those stories, now people form these bonds and connections. And we all I mean, we see this play out in, in you know, in other things, not just advertising. Like if you watch a movie like The Shawshank Redemption, like everybody remembers like that great story. Or if you're you know, if you're a fan of, you know, any, anything in sports, whenever they're doing like those almost like those documentaries leading up to the event, whether it's like a boxing match or some other sporting event um, two you know, two athletes that you did not even know or care anything about before, you know it. Now you're like you're rooting for one of them. And like, how did that happen? And it's really because they tell you the story of like, OK, well, now you see what this person's family is like, what are their motivations, what drives them, why they do what they do. Uh, and that creates a level of just authenticity and relatability that you don't just get when you're just saying hire me now or reach out for a consultation. So I'm of the belief that people really buy what, you know, why you do more importantly than just what you do. And when I used to, when I used to speak in the early days, I didn't you know, want to share my story because I felt that, you know, I didn't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I didn't want to say, you know, Hey, I'm an immigrant and I grew up poor and all, all these different Different things. But I realized that when I did share that, people would come up to me afterwards after those presentations and they, you know, they, they were telling me they're also an immigrant and they also had a similar upbringing and they, you know, that they were able to connect with me. So um, I, I think in the absence of telling those stories, you're kind of missing out on a lot of those connections too. So it really just comes down to how can you authentically convey here's who you are, why you do what you do. And I don't really believe that like people truly will believe you unless they know the story behind it. I totally agree. Well, I loved hearing that at your last conference. I mean, you had people who weren't lawyers. Obviously, your audience, uh, I, I'm assuming, is is mostly at attorneys. But why do you invite people in to speak who are not attorneys? I mean, what what is kind of the um, the strategy and thinking behind that? Because I think it's it's a good one. Yeah. I mean, so, so for one, I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. That, that's interesting because in our industry, we're the largest law firm growth company and no one here is, is, is a lawyer. It, 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 the reality of it is, is that we're not teaching, especially at our conferences and what we do at Chris, we're not teaching them how to practice law. I, I think law schools for that. And like when they're coming in, we assume like you, you're a great lawyer. Like you care about your clients. It's everything surrounding that. So it's like the business side of the practice and everything from customer service and client experience to how to really grow as a leader, to how to build a great team and hire and train and develop people to just building out a great culture and marketing and so on. So I've always felt that it's important to bring in perspectives from other industries. So, it, it, and this is across the board. Like, so for example, you mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary comes in and he's talking about marketing and, and of course now crypto and NFTs. And then we'll have, you know, another speaker coming in like Cy Wakeman, who she spoke about like just culture overall. Um, and then you've got Malcolm Gladwell. And it, I think if you can draw inspiration from those those that come from other backgrounds and other industries. I've always said, because over the years, we've sometimes have brought in speakers that not everybody loved, right? They, they, they felt they were controversial in some way. And I, I've always said, I, I say this at the, at the start of every conference, that if you're only willing to listen to people that you like and you agree with, then your learning is going to be limited, okay? So just if you can embrace various perspectives about different issues, I mean, who better to learn, uh, just as an example from, you know, about winning, then Tim Grover, who we had at the last conference, who was Michael Jordan's coach and Kobe Bryant's coach. Um, and, you know, for example, who better to learn about negotiation than Chris Voss, the FBI hostage negotiator. So it's it, you know, being able to do that, I think, is really unique. And then also our conference is a business conference. It's a business and leadership conference. And uh, and, and ultimately, I look at who are, are the, the, the right thought leaders in those spaces, who, who are the people that have the right experience. And it's applicable. I mean, to me, Business is business, whether you're running a law firm or a dental practice or whatever it is. I think the the core elements of, of leading a team and creating a great culture and hiring and so on are pretty unanimous across the board, across different, you know, different types of industries. But you know what, what's made ours special is that we do keep it, of course, focused to you know, the legal industry and there's different applications of that. But we invite everyone. Yes, it's it's uh, it, it's a law firm growth conference. But when you when you look at some of the speakers that we've had, you know, it's really about who's going to bring the, you know, the best insights from marketing, from leadership, from culture, you know, all across the board. And and our aim is to make it a transformational two day experience. I totally agree. I talk a lot about when I really want to learn something, I actually go outside of of what I know 
outside of my industry. So I'm rarely attending, for example, beverage conferences. Or when I was in the tech industry, I was more likely to, you know, literally look through um, what what some of my friends were doing, what conferences they were going to. And if I saw a speaker that I had never heard speak or somebody that was interesting, I mean, it was enough of a pull for me to go. And I found that just by going and listening to people outside of my industry, that's where I could, you know, learn that much more kind of whiteboard vision, um, just just about different things. And one of the things that we did at Hint uh, back in 2012 was take what I already had knowledge of direct to consumer and bring that in to an industry that wasn't viewing direct to consumer as an option. So uh, even today, I mean, most most beverage executives are saying, oh, yeah, we're on Amazon. And when I talk to people about the difference between being on Amazon and being having your own website and, you know, within Within seven years, we had over a million consumers who were buying on drinkhint.com. And, and, uh, you know, all of those things really came from me going outside of my comfort zone to be able to listen to people, how they grew things. So I totally agree with what you're saying. And frankly, most of the places where I'm speaking also today are to groups of people that are not in the beverage industry, um, that are not female founders and entrepreneurs. People always look at you know what the heck are you doing speaking to a bunch of CFOs or or um, or law firms or medical profession. Um, and anyway, I just find it really really interesting because I think that that's more and more what people are doing when they're trying to figure out who they should have come speak at conferences to. So I really really appreciated that. And so tell me a little bit and and the listeners about where they can find out more about Crisp and also more about you. Sure, sure. So a, a great starting point, I, I always think it's like the book and the podcast, and that's GameChangingAttorney.com. Uh, of course, there's our website, and that's just crisp.co. Um, so we've got, undergone a, a rebrand. It's, it's kind of interesting to go from video to marketing to, to coaching, and that you just, you know, as, as the company has grown and scaled over the years, it's, it's almost like this change in identity of people that once knew us as this video company, this legal video company, and then this marketing company, um, and now see us as really this, you know, this law firm growth company where it's, it's training and education, and you know, it's, it's a it's a very different type type of business. So, and then um, I've also, this is weird for me. I'm still uh, wrapping my head around this in terms of my comfort level, but the, but it, the team finally pushed me to do it a couple of years ago. Um, I also have a website, michaelmogul.com, and there's you know, all sorts of things like blogs and uh, blog articles. And so the, so the podcasts are there too. So that's, that's another way. Really inspiring stuff too. So I went to your website and it was really, really great. So thank you so much, Michael. And thank you everybody for listening. And if you haven't subscribed to the Kara Golden podcast, please do so. And uh, we're here every Monday and Wednesday with amazing, amazing, inspiring stories and leadership tips and journeys just like Michael's. So definitely check in with us. Uh, give five stars to this episode on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And you can follow me as well on all social channels at Kara Golden with an I. And finally, if you haven't picked up a copy of my book, Undaunted, uh, sharing a little bit more about me and the story of building Hint, please do so. And of course, pick up a, a case of your favorite hint flavor. I've got it right here, the blackberry. Uh, and hope you all have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, Michael.